Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the open forum, and we would like to request you to kindly be seated now, as we may have to proceed with our open forum today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bonjour, Madame and uh, Monsieur. My name is Bredipta, and we would like to welcome you to Indonesian Open Forum, the Open Forum on Developing the People's Internet in the Era of Fake News, Hoax, and Disinformation. As I've mentioned, that uh, I'll be moderating this session. I am from the representative of Indonesian Internet Governance Forum slash the coordinator of Youth Indonesian IGF. Thank you for your attendance and interest in this Open Forum. And as you know, that Currently, the focus on the emerging trend on the distribution of fake news and disinformation are massive nowadays. Be it politically motivated or not, distribution of fake news, disinformation, misinformation, or any of its similar equivalents are revolving around of our livelihood. It is obvious that the pressing matter now is not only to prevent, anticipate, or also uh, putting a solution to it, but, also, but to ensure the good and proper development of our internet for the betterness of our society. In Indonesia, the government of Indonesia has tried various approaches by way of including several of its stakeholders in combating fake news. However, we believe that this effort shall not stop there and shall be improved further. As such, we are here to discuss and share the best approach from our expert panels here including from Indonesia, in our attempt to counter fake news phenomenon. However, prior to start our session today, we would like to uh, share a message from Mr. David Kay, uh, our uh, panelist, who unfortunately is not available today due to emergency, emergency situation that he has to attend to, and he will be replaced by Mr. Amisto, by his colleague, Mr. Amisto. Okay, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Anang Latif of Government of Indonesia to deliver his opening statement in our open forum today. Mr. Anang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, speakers, participants. Ah, this is about Indonesia. Indonesia since 2015 has tried to resolve connectivity issues, especially for ICT sector. At the time, only 78% of the cities and districts, numbering more than 500, were connected to the fiber networks. Why it has to be fiber optic networks? Because we know fiber is the only backbone media that can provide broadband services. With affirmative policy, the government must intervene so that every city and district can be reached by broadband services, even though not visible on a business mode basis. By the first quarter of 2019, all broadband connectivity will reach all cities and districts through a project called Palaparing, which is a 12,000 kilometer fiber optic networks project that connects the last 90 cities and districts. Indonesia is an archipelago with 17,000 islands, one of the largest islands in the world with 264 million population. Along with resolving this connectivity issue since 2015, the Indonesian government has also started how network utilization can be optimized and has an impact on economic growth significantly. The number of internet customers that reach 143 million should have a positive impact on the development of Indonesian economy and become a new economic power, not be a victim of technology developments. Based on data as early as 2018, the most widely used social media by netizens in Indonesia are YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
while the top messenger application is WhatsApp and Line. As for data from the survey, it turns out that the highest hot distribution channel in Indonesia is from social media and the messenger application. The most delivered hoax content is related to the political issue, especially issue related to the candidates in local election as well as the presidential one, followed by issue related to the religion and ethnic hatred. This type of disinformation has been proven in threatening political stability, hampering social development, and eroding democratic process in, in the upcoming legislative and presidential election. Also, according to the survey, it is believed that the most effective way to prevent the spread of hoaxes was a combination of public education and legal action. Among the last number of internet users, there are many stowaways who spread malicious content and information disorder, such as disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. Last year, data from the ministry explained that at least 1,800,000 1, websites were found spreading false information, not to mention hoaxes delivered via social media and instant messaging application. A number of hoax actors turn out to be organized neatly. This shows that the spread of hoaxes and hate speech has become an industry. In 2017, the Indonesian police arrested hoax and hate speech syndicate organization called Sarachan and Cyber Army Network. They conducted hoax and hate speech factory against political target. They charged around six to seven thousand US dollars to publish and spread one package of customer hoax via modern media social empowered by thousand media accounts, either it is fake account or hack account. The Indonesia Ministry of Communication and Information Technology is committed to carry out a massive, comprehensive, and systematic top-to-down approach in maintaining a healthy internet ecosystem in Indonesia. The top part is to strengthen education and development of human resource or brainware in which cyber creacy, the digital literacy national movement takes part. Cyber creacy is a harmonious collaboration among the government, community, CSO, academics, private sector, and mass media to promote digital literacy for a better internet for all. They keenly promote digital literacy to become an essential part of the ICT curriculum, both in formal and non-formal educational educational institution. Then, at the dawn part, the ministry will collaborate with law enforcement official from the Indonesia Polician, Indonesian Police Corps to act against those who intentionally produce, contribute, and or disseminate malicious content that violates, that violates the law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anang Lati, for your presentation and as well as opening statement. Now, as uh, we have our panel already in place, and I would like to raise a question to, as a follow-up to Mr. Amistov, that as you may have heard from what Mr. Anang Lati has mentioned, that at some point, a legal action needs to be taken to ensure that the disinformation and spread of fake news are not really distributed among the community. See, but, but the fact is many of them believe that freedom of opinion and expression shall not be limited, which however, it also has its access to deliver uh, offensive speech and, and negative content speech. Where do we draw this line between freedom of expression and to ensure that this information and fake news is not spreaded? 
Florida Bears. Yeah, right. I think that's a good question. But before I go into that, I know some of you might be disappointed that um, David Kay, who is the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, isn't here today. Um, he sends his regards. And unfortunately, as you said, he has to um, be back in LA for uh, a family emergency. Um, so I'm Amos To, and I serve as legal advisor to the um, Special Rapporteur. And I think you know your question raises um, issues about what the fake news problem is, right? Is it so? So the way, and I think there was an excellent background paper, and Mr. Latif's presentation kind of alludes to some of the issues um, that that underlie the fake news problem. I think the fake news problem sits on top of a complex stack of social, economic, and political issues. Um, and that was well reflected in the background paper. I think there were three things, right, in particular that came out of that paper that are very relevant to this discussion on what the role is for human rights standards. The first one is that the ideological fault lines and ethnic tensions that stem from you know, the nation's history with communist insurgencies, um, and it's a history that needs to be grappled with, um, and which has fueled suspicion um, against ethnically Chinese populations and leaders well before this rise of, of so-called fake news. Uh, the second issue is, you know, um, and, and Mr. Latif talked about this a bit um, in the, the Sarakan Syndicate, and, and how hoaxes have become like uh, a huge source of financial gain. But you know, it, that also kind of sits atop, on top of a network of platforms, right, and a social media culture that very much still fundamentally prioritizes virality over veracity. Right? And so if you think about how that interacts with the way that content is fundamentally being promoted on these platforms, right, and how the adv advertising model drives that kind of content, um, then we might think about, you know, um, solutions that, that go beyond or that are not have anything to do with, like, prohibition on content. And so the final thing is, is the digital literacy issue, right, which the paper also flags about how the educational system has not necessarily equipped people with the standards of digital literacy to cope with um, this high information age. So, so I think there are some issues here. Um, and I think just by kind of articulating these issues, it demonstrates that um, a straight up prohibition right, of content, right, whether it's falsehoods, um, in itself it actually presents problems because these usually are vaguely formulated. But I think we can clearly see that that may not also be uh, the solution we are looking for because it doesn't resolve all of these underlying issues um, that makes fake news so uh, poignant an issue today. Thank you, Mr. Top, for your input. And I, from what I understand from your uh, statement is straight up prohibition is not always the cure for all, any of this issue. There has to be another means and approach accompanying this prohibition as well, I think. Yeah, so, so I think um, the, the, well, the, I think that, you know, content-based prohibitions are generally suspect under international human rights standards. Um, the, the, a group of freedom of expression experts from various intergovernmental institutions have put out this thing called a joint declaration on disinformation and propaganda. And one of the things and the general principles they articulate is that, um, you know, based on observations on how states have been regulating this issue is that a lot of the time the legislation is vague, right? It prohibits falsehoods um, but doesn't really define and I don't think is capable of defining what a falsehood means, which leaves it very open to the kinds of abuses um, as, as of censorship that, that we see uh, can be prevalent when you have a very vaguely formulated uh, content-based prohibition. Thank you for your clarification, Mr. Ta. So um, I guess we will go to the next uh, panelist, Ms. Uh, Irene Putranto. Um, she is a researcher currently in University of Toronto. So uh, Ms. Uh, Irene Putranto, how do you see hoax and disinformation in the present context of Internet of Trust? Sure, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Irene Putranto, and I work with the Citizen Lab. We're a cybersecurity and human rights uh, research lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you to uh, the Indonesia's ICT ministry for uh, 
organizing this open forum. And thank you for all of you for, for being here today. So um, I'll just raise a few points uh, with regard to the question um, that the moderator just raised. Um, the, the first issue, I think, uh, is definitions. Um, the fact that definitions matter, like what do we mean when we say hoaxes or, or fake news um, or disinformation. Uh, however, oftentimes, uh, precise definitions are left out from efforts to, to handle or to counter hoax, disinformation, and false news. And I believe my colleague uh, Jackie will uh, illustrate why this is problematic, uh, specifically with the case of Malaysia. Um, as um, my colleague Amos Toh um, has mentioned earlier, uh, the, the vagueness in how uh, hoaxes or, or fake news uh, are defined uh, could potentially result in infringing freedom of expression online. Um, with uh, fake news increasingly becoming an issue, uh, there's also been increasing pressure on platforms uh, to, to regulate uh, the, the spread of uh, hoaxes and, and fake news, and I believe my colleague Jake will, will touch on that in his presentation, so I'll, I'll leave that out for now. Um, it's interesting that uh, this morning research from uh, BBC indicate that a rising tide of nationalism uh, in the case of India is driving ordinary citizens to, uh, to spread fake news. And I think this is uh, not just unique to India, I think it's, it's uh, something that we're seeing um, in Indonesia as well. Um, the, fake, uh, the, the fact that Indonesia is a, a country that has uh, religious and cultural uh, diversity uh, make uh, issues of hoaxes and fake news potentially explosive. Um, and so false news stories are not just a problem in the West, uh, but other countries around the world as well is, is the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and so the question is why, why does it matter, right? Um, in order to maintain an open and democratic system, um, I think it's important for government, private sector, civil society, and citizens to work together to, to solve this problem because it is a very complex problem. And so it's great that we have a, a multi-stakeholder panel uh, sitting in front of us today, and I'm looking forward to the discussions um, on how to counter this issue. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patrand, Ms. Patrando, uh, for your input. And I think we can also continue to Ms. Uh, Jackie, because as our, uh, as our uh, fellow Southeast Asian nation and neighborhood country, we share the same problem. And we also recently heard that Malaysia has passed a law to, to counter and regulate hate speech. Then, and some, some sayings there that it may prevent proper enforcement of human rights and protection of freedom uh, of speech and how and we would like to know more and how how can civil society engage in shaping internet policy strategies and influencing the government to comply to the internet freedom norms uh, thanks very much. I think, first of all, I just need to clarify that the anti-fake news law was never really intended to counter or address disinformation. It was rushed through Parliament, it was n not really discussed, tabled in record time and gazetted a month before the elections. And the primary objective was really to prevent people from talking about or sharing information or having discussions about a very high um, profile corruption case of our then Prime Minister. So I think the intentions also matter. And then you see the processes, which then reveals the intentions, no? But saying that, I think this information is a real problem and a real issue. And I'll share with you a particular um, example that I'm familiar with in Malaysia. Um, just prior to the election, a website popped up. And it looks like a, it looks like a news website. It's called monara.com. Um, it looks like a news aggregator website. It seems to be very credible. It seems to be very, very well resourced. But what happened was it had a lot of headlines that were clickbaity. And the headlines and the news was basically trying to put together two different things. One is about um, queer people, so LGBTQ community, plus progressive Muslims. So they put these two things together, um, created a lot of different news information that got shared very widely on Twitter and social media because it was very clickbaity at a period where I was basically squishing 20 to 30 Twitter bots every day on an account. So. What the, impact, what, this, what the impact of this is that, um, is that this is, um, sorry, yeah, I'm just trying to look at my notes because I'm talking very quickly. <laughs> um, what it did is that it encouraged, when this circulation happened and what um, Amos was alluding to, where you know the platforms itself really privileged virality over veracity, is that it got shared very widely 
It encouraged everyday mullahs who were on Twitter to attack non-conforming Twitter users on what is or is not Islam, what is or is not Malaysian, attacking particular kinds of individuals who were already marginalized. So, for example, young women who were not wearing the hijab, um, trans women, outing queer people, ordinary people who wanted to have a conversation about citizenship, nationhood or religion. Um, it created a kind of very broad-based surveillance of queer community online. It resulted in raids on venues that were perceived as being queer or events. It also resulted in physical attacks on transgender women still and is increasing. So you're seeing like very real impact based on this kind of a, a situation. Um, so then the queer community decided to do some research in relation to this, so tried to find out who funded Manara, the website, and found that it had links to government um, uh, like to state agencies, um, who are the ones who circulated the news in the first place in a targeted way. So this relied on an existing network of users who are interested in social capital, who are gaming the network infrastructure of social media, who are doing this, 20 to 30 bots again. Um, and the government has also already said very openly that they spent hundreds of thousands to build a kind of a cyber army to, man to look at the internet maybe also on the reason of trying to keep the internet safe from this information. So I think what this reveals is that it's a very complex landscape. It's not something that's very simple, it's not um, direct, and therefore having, uh, you know, you have many different actors who are involved in this. You have government who had resources, who want to control narrative and news cycle, um, who are building an army of people who's doing this. You have individuals who want to do this in order to consolidate their own power. You have private actors who benefit from this economy of creating and circulating tactical disinformation, you have companies that are being created, you have a media landscape that is weak, high skepticism and mistrust of information and institutions, built on networks of trust, basically forwarding by somebody I know and trust. So it's super complex, right? So then you cannot have a simple solution to deal with this, to say, okay, we're going to have a law, and the law is going to then um, deal with this, especially when it's a very badly written law with very poor definitions and wanting to create kind of really weird institutions to try and do this work. So a complex landscape therefore requires a complex ecosystem approach to try and deal with this and I'll stop for now because I think I've spoken a lot but I would like to continue at some point later. Yeah. Thank you Ms. Cheki for your uh, sharing. It's been very interesting that as we know as well that inform misinformation, fake news and uh, this problem is uh, very very complex landscape it's not only there is no single and generic cure that can solve this issue at the moment in an instant in instantly so i think we will go to uh, mr jack lucky from uh, google that will share uh, how google as a platform provider can do more to counteract harmful negative content on the internet and to establish compliance with prevailing regulations in, in the certain jurisdictions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much to the government of Indonesia for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure and for being with such a distinguished group of uh, co-panelists. I agree with basically everything that's been said so far, so it makes my job pretty easy, I guess, uh, that this is a really, really complex problem. And I think one of the challenges for identifying solutions is that when people use the term fake news or misinformation, they're often referring to many different things. So we've heard everything from election interference to stoking up hate speech and religious tensions to trying to stoke up um, uh, hatred toward particularly marginalized groups. There's also lots of discussion of spam, uh, misleading type of content. Some people use it to refer to reporting errors or biased reporting or opinion pieces masquerading as, as regular sort of objective journalism. So I think that just shows you how complex the problem is when we're not even talking about the same thing. We actually may be talking about many different problems. And the solutions that we need to employ will probably vary a bit depending on the different manifestation of the problem that we're talking about. So that's been a lot of the way we've tried to approach handling this at Google. We know that it's a really hard issue, but it's also one that cuts to the very core of our mission. Because at Google, our mission has always been to organize all of the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. So if you think misinformation, that's basically the antithesis of our mission. It's exactly what we're trying not to do. But we did recognize that there were places where we had weak points, where we weren't doing as well as we could have in that, in that, era, in that area. So we started thinking about what are the ways that we can kind of do, do three different things. 
One is really product solutions. So how can we do things within our products to make them do a better job at surfacing authoritative content while also kind of burying things that aren't authoritative or could be misinformation? So I'll talk through a few of those in a moment. But then the second two pieces I think are actually as or, or more important, which is how can we help to support journalists who are doing high quality journalism to both get their work into the digital space, give them tools to make sure that their work is easily discoverable by consumers and users, and then also to make sure that we have networks of partners who can do fact checks and who can actually work with journalists to make sure that common stories that could be misinformation are, are debunked and they're easily visible to consumers. And then the third piece that I would say is, was mentioned earlier as well, which is media literacy. At the end of the day, we know that misinformation has always existed. Even before the internet, we had to deal with gossipy neighbors who were you know, telling things that were not true about people who live down the street. And I mean, the fact that the people are gonna tell things that aren't true is always gonna be a problem in the world. So how can we make sure that the education that our young people are receiving, and that even as adults we're receiving, that we have the critical thinking and the skills to be able to navigate the online world and be able to know how to check our sources and have the orientation to not just believe things, but also to go through and try to find whether it can be verified. So this is another area that we've been, been doing quite a bit of support. But I'll share just a couple of things, I think, in the first area that are important to mention, which is, for us, at the end of the day, it's going to be impossible to ever determine whether all of the content online is true and false. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to come up with scalable solutions to actually get at some of the virality dimensions that were mentioned earlier. So for example, we started doing a lot of improvements to our algorithms, starting with search, but then this has also been later added into YouTube, where for queries that are related to public interest type topics, we, priorita we prioritize authoritativeness over relevance. So what that means is, let's say you search for something, you search for, you know, where, what are movie show times? There are two things that you might want in, in surfacing uh, an answer to your question. One would be how relevant is the result to the query you've asked, and then the other is how authoritative is the source, right? And so for certain queries, you might think, I actually just want something that's really relevant, that's exactly the question that I asked, and I don't care so much how authoritative the source is, because it's a relatively easy question. Uh, but then there might be other topics, like things in the public interest, that even a source that is directly on point to the question you asked, if you're trying to get an answer on a sensitive public topic, you actually want it to come from an authoritative source that's more reliable. So we've started prioritizing the way that we surface content to make it more focused on authoritativeness and less on relevance. So these are some of the things that we've been trying to implement across our products. And also to make fact checks and things like this that amplify quality journalism more visible. For example, in, in the search bar, you'll now see fact check tags for many stories. So we're trying to just make sure that people have access to that quality information that's out there and that it's easily right at their fingertips. So those are just some of the sort of things that we've been trying to think about from the product perspective and how we can promote the good. But then also to get at some of the bad stuff as well, we've launched a number of policies where we no longer allow any advertising revenue for content that is misrepresentative. So content where, where the identity of the producer is misrepresented, as in this example here. We don't allow that type of content to receive any ad revenue on any Google products and platforms anymore. So these are some of the types of ways that we're trying to kind of get at the money of, that, that can feed into some of these types of problematic misinformation that we see. We also have policies that prohibit hate speech. So any type of misinformation that would be stoking up hatred on the basis of someone's religion or ethnicity or sexual orientation, we would not only just demonetize that content, but we wouldn't allow it for uh, products like YouTube, uh, where we host content. We don't allow that kind of content, so we would just remove it from the platform globally. So this is just to show you, it's very complicated. We have a whole lot of stuff going on. I've only given you a couple of examples, but it's just to show you that there's so many different manifestations of the problem, but we're trying to kind of think through them one by one and think what's the most appropriate response for this and how can we really partner with third parties, with NGOs, with journalists, with government to figure out ways we can come together to solve the problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jake Lucci, for, for your setting. And um, as you may know already that we are supposed to have Ms. Julia Ward in our session. However, she will have to come later as she has another queries to attend to at the moment. So while we waiting for her, I think it would be better for us to proceed to our discussion session as this is an open forum and 
Therefore, I would like to invite all of our participants here to address the panel, or maybe if you have some comments or follow-ups on the deliveries or relevant issues. Thank you. Hello, my name is Iwana. I'm here with the MLDI team from England, and my question is about definition again, because I think it's really important to try and contextualize this issue. And you, Jake, especially mentioned trying to find the line between truth and falsehood. And I think one of the main problems that I find with fake news as an issue that comes up in discussion is that oftentimes it's not simply true or false. And we've had a lot of mention of Twitter bots already as being a problem in the Malaysia case study or all of these other kind of tangential issues with misrepresentation or manipulated images bots. So I guess my question is how do you tackle fake news when really it's not one issue, it's all of these several multi-layered kind of issues coming together. Sir, was that, was that one for me or for Jack? I couldn't catch. Go for it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so from the panels, which, is there any of you want to address? The, maybe Ms. Ms. Becky, yes. Um, I think you hit it exactly where it is. It is a complex multi-dimensional issue. And I think the other point about it is as well is that it does differ from context to context and that it manifests and expresses itself differently. So I think the first thing that actually is very, very critical and necessary is research. Research based on context, especially by communities who are particularly affected to understand how is it happening, what are the strategies, who are the actors, what is the different kinds of economies that are circulating and underpinning it. Because without research, you really are not able to respond to this. So to everybody who's sitting in the room who is interested in research or is funding research in some ways, to also prioritize this because it's really very difficult. And for technology companies to develop tools and products, as you call it, that enables research to be easier because we tried to do this in APC. So I'm with the Association for Progressive Communications. I forgot to introduce myself. Um, and we are in a global network organization that works on ICTs and social change and human rights. And we tried to do this research in three different contexts and it was extremely difficult because it was difficult to get the kinds of tools, to be able to get the kinds of data, it was difficult to resource it. And then when you do the research, it's also really difficult to say, I want to publish this because it's for kind of your own um, understanding, right? So I want to emphasize this point as well. That's really critical. And then the other is to really strengthen media as an institution and whatever it takes to strengthen this in terms of the environment, whether it's in terms of strengthening freedom of expression and freedom of information laws, data protection laws, creating media, independent media councils and so forth. That is actually critical because we need to also in some ways renew our faith on institutions to be able to do some of these things, right? Because right now there is a huge trust deficit and skepticism in terms of institutional institutions that we have developed for truth. Um, and um, the other, and I think, and I just want to say two more things. One is that there is, it's necessary to support content creation and content creation by different actors in communities. So whether these be fact checking or creating alternative narratives and so forth, it's actually extremely difficult to do that. There's not a lot. And that's why I think often people fall into these kinds of economic incentives um, in order to be able to generate and build on the content and information economy. But to support other kinds of content creation, I think is particularly critical um, in this juncture. And finally, um, literacy is something that is not just um, not just for young people or in schools. It is a literacy that is necessary for all ages that needs to happen at all times to create a communications culture um, that is actually not just about trying to figure out whether this is the truth or not. I think that's the problem with definition. How do you define whether something is the real truth? Because it is about contesting knowledges. It's about con contesting um, frameworks of epistemologies and you know it's about power ultimately so what do you need to do in this particular moment it's not to say well this is more truthful BBC is more truthful than the star but it's about being able to generate a, a, a kind of communications culture that says I'm going to critically analyze 
different things um, by different people, whichever the source it comes from, whether it's WhatsApp or whether it's a website and so forth. So it, yeah, it does require like sort of complex multi-dimensional approach. No simple solutions, I'm afraid. Th thank you, Ms. Jackie. Do you want to add another one, Mr. Jack? Yeah, not much. I, I think that what Jack said is, is just right, and I also agree with your question. As I was mentioning earlier, you know, we look a lot at both what are the motivations of purveyors of disinformation. So, for you know, example, m monetary motivation motivations then demonetizing, having advertising policies will have an impact. But if it's really about stoking up hate speech and it's not for monetary motivation, then that's not going to have an impact, right? So you need to have content policies that also make sure that you're prioritizing safety um, for for a particular group. So we really try to think about different manifestations of the problem. But at the end of the day, I very much agree with Jack that having this culture of media literacy and be able to critically engage with information is super, super important. And to me, if I had to say one thing that I think of as the most important place that we need to be focusing energy, I, I agree with Jack that it's probably there. Because at the end of the day, no matter how great of solutions we all continue to come up with, there's always gonna, this problem is always going to exist. So I think we have to have a culture of being able to critically engage online. So yeah, very much agree with that. Thank you, Mr. Jake. And Ms. Putranto would like to address a question as well. Yeah, sure. I, thank you. I'd also like to say that I agree with Jack. It's great to be on a panel with Jack, then I can just agree with to Jack. Um, uh, on the point of the need to, uh, for there to be more research, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and as Jack mentioned, uh, the biggest uh, hurdle with research is always funding. And so if there are funders in the room, um, research on the, in this topic is, is definitely required. And I, I'd also like to say that I think partnership between research institutions uh, with platforms are required because some platforms are easier to do this type of research on than others. Um, I have heard Twitter being described as a cesspool. <laughs> and I think we can say that because it's a lot easier to scrape data on Twitter more so than the other platforms. So I think there needs to be uh, cooperation between um, academics and researchers with these platforms to do this kind of research and the funding that is required. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Petranto, and um, I would like to uh, go to second question from Lady in back. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alia. I work as a researcher in Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy. And um, it is an open question for all of the panelists. So. Um, there is this statement from the previous speaker, um, Anang Latif, that say that um, legal actions is one of the most effective ways to prevent disinformation. And I want to ask, um, what is the view of all the panelists about this, um, imposing sanctions for online intermediaries for its user content that amounts to disinformation? Um, having in mind that Indonesian government is gearing up for the upcoming election, and I think that this information issues is like heating up in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I think Mr. Latif would like to address the question first, or? Yeah. I think the question uh, should be to the other speakers here, yeah, but let me uh, clarify. From my experience, yeah, from the ministry, the government to handle this one, to combat the fake news, cannot walk alone. Yeah. We have to make fake news as a, our common enemies. Yeah. Law enforcement is something important, but much more in the important. I agree with the Zeki that uh, how to educate people, how to, um, to provide the digital literacy, as well as the people understand yeah, about uh, what is the internet actually. Yeah. And we have to involve all stakeholders yeah, to combat this fake news. What we have done uh, to establish uh, cyber creation, yeah, to involve any stakeholder yeah, from the researcher, from the academic, from the uh, non-government organization. Yeah. This is uh, because government believe yeah, we cannot reach all part of a country. Yeah? We have to know that the, the internet itself, the information, not only can kill people, but also can to destroy, to destroy the country. This is very dangerous. We have to aware about this one. Yeah? That's why uh, 
government has to be serious, provide some budget to combat this one, provide some serious organization yeah, to face this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Latif, for your clarification as well, uh, feedback. And I think they, Mr. Amistad would like to sure. address as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, under the, the International Covenant yes, on Civil and Political right. Rights, which Indonesia ratified in 2006, you know, states that restrictions on freedom of expression must be provided by law and necessary and proportionate to fulfill like specified legitimate aims. And that part, the part of um, that provision that really is relevant and salient here is the provided by law requirement. Um, and international human rights jurisprudence is clear that it just can't simply be law on paper, right? So you can't simply say because these sanctions are legally mandated, therefore they fulfill that requirement. Um, human rights jurisprudence requires that laws have certain qualities in order for it to be considered a legitimate legal standard under um, the ICCPR, right? So in this case, you know, vaguely formulated laws that have been rushed through parliament without appropriate public consultation raises a lot of red flags. Um, and on as complex an issue as um, false uh, disinformation, um, you know, a, a simple kind of prohibition um, really doesn't necessarily do the work that um, states are obliged to do under the ICCPR. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Amisto. And we would like to welcome Ms. Julie Ward for her attendance in this uh, meeting as well. Yes. Ms. Julie Ward, as, we, as I actually have previously announced to the forum that we are currently in the discussion session in, in waiting for you, we would like to uh, pause this discussion session first and f proceed to your speech, or would you prefer to keep at the discussion first? But I, I, I mean, personally, I suggest to go with your uh, statement first before we further continue the discussion. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak at this event. And I am very sorry I couldn't be with you for the whole of the, um, of the discussion. Um, it's an issue that um, I really care about um, for a number of reasons, um, not least because my country and other um, European countries, but also countries in the developing world, um, we've seen have been the victims of targeted interference, fake news, um, distortion, uh, uh, a whole load of um, interferences. Uh, with, frankly, interferences with democracy. So the result in my country being um, the Brexit referendum, uh, we know that um, the election in the US was interfered with. We now know that the election in um, Brazil uh, was hugely interfered with um, use, uh, via a WhatsApp, yeah. Um, I actually do... Um, election observation from my parliament, for the European Parliament, and the same methods of interference that were used in uh, the States, um, also in the French presidential elections, uh, the last ones. Um, uh, we know that the same methods um, were used in Kenya as well. Um, not many people know about this, um, but you should really look at what's been happening. The same companies, the same people using the same methods, but increasingly um, making them very sophisticated. Okay, so um, I believe that actually what we're talking about um, is really fundamentally challenging our d d democracies. Um, so how can we make sure that changes in the media um, sphere um, happen in the interest of democracy and plural, pluralism and not the contrary. And um, I work in the Education and Culture Committee for the European Parliament and for me it's ensuring that education for citizenship, including e-citizenship, is at the top of the education agenda. And the second um, important pillar for me is supporting through proper means um, quality journalism and media. Um, and we can't avoid the issue of the responsibility of social media and the platforms in combating fake news. And we are beginning to take um, measures regarding that in the European Parliament. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about media literacy. 
because media literacy enables citizens to both use and create media content effectively and safely. Media literate people, and so we should also say digitally literate people, um, are able to exercise more informed choices. They can understand the nature of the content and the services. They can take advantage of the full range of opportunities offered by communication technologies. And that's important because we, uh, the internet should be a space for the common good. It's not just a space for danger, for hate, for misinformation. We have to reclaim the internet for the common good. Um, uh, in that respect, media literacy and education for citizenship are not only important for learning about the tools, but also to encourage a shift in political cultures and practices so that um, individuals can not only be digital consumers, but also active citizens in connected societies. And media literacy, it, for me, it's not about being passive, but it's about governance and participation. And children and young people should be able to participate. They need to be able to access information. They need to understand how media works. They need to develop critical thinking. They've got to learn how to deal with a whole range of different opinions, how to react to online violence, hate speech, cyberbullying, and so on. Um, we talk a lot about um, skills, um, the uh, skills gap in, in, the, Euro in the European sphere, um, but a key skill that young people need to have in order to make a difference is digital curiosity and creative thinking. So I think we have to support quality journalism and media pluralism, as I said before, um, and we should investigate what it takes to encourage the development of independent quality information sources online, what opportunities e-democracy might offer in terms of renewing different forms of political partic participation and communication. So, Because I do um, election observation, I've seen many, many different models, and I, we only do election observation in fragile democracies, frankly, we, but we ought to be doing it in some of our um, Western democracies where we think we, we own the best models of democracy because, frankly, we've seen how we fall, we've fallen very, very short recently. Um, we've got to support quality journalism, but we've also got to defend freedom of expression. And that must include defending atta attacked or imprisoned journalists. Um, I've been participating um, in a project with the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, um, highlighting many of the journalists who are currently imprisoned. I have to say huge numbers of them in Turkey. Um, we have, um, uh, we've been partnering with particular journalists so that we can support them, we can raise up their cases, we can keep them in the public domain, you know, because what happens is, uh, people are on the front page, then they're on the inside page, then they're on the third page, then they're not in the newspapers at all, but they're still in prison and they're still under attack. So the person who I have been supporting um, and twinning with is Zara Doan, who is a Kurdish woman, um, feminist woman, editor of Jinha, which is a really amazing uh, feminist media collective. She's been in prison, she's an artist as well as a journalist, she's in prison for painting a picture depicting um, tanks, Turkish tanks as beasts, as animals in the city of Nusayabin where the Turkish government um, bombarded um, civilian targets. And I've been there so I know what I'm talking about, okay. Um, so I talked about safety of um, online companies and maybe just finally just a little bit about safety online. Um, I'm a children's rights campaigner, so one of the discussions we have to have is about making the internet um, a safe space for children and young people. Um, not taking away their rights, but making sure that they're safe. Um, uh, also applies to vulnerable people. Um, uh, and one of the issues for us is that uh, we see many platforms taking down um, uh, pornographic content or dangerous content or hateful content, but it doesn't stay down. So a big issue for us is making sure that this, uh, that, uh, this content stays down, that it's completely removed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Julie Ward, and thank you also for your statement. And we will proceed to the discussion session as we have agreed previously. And a uh, moment, I see some uh, hand was raised and I would like to address the gentleman on the left side. Uh, 
Thank you uh, very much for the floor. Uh, I wanted to touch upon additional uh, thing that maybe hasn't been discussed so much yet, namely that there are indeed some uh, governments and countries that can and indeed do produce misinformation on sp or sponsor its production to forward their own agenda. I, I will not name any particular countries, but I'm sure everyone can think of uh, some uh, of them. And what do you do in this case? I mean, they will not care about ad money, for example. You can't really do any legal punishment for them, if, especially if they operate in another country. I mean, what is the solution in these kind of situations uh, is what I would like to hear your views on this, because this is even more complex uh, than if you have simply somebody who's doing it for money or for fun or for whatever the reasons are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the question would be better addressed to Mr. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very, uh, very good question. So there are some things that you can do that are regardless of the origin of, of, of misinformation. So for example, we do a lot of work on uh, trying to combat inauthentic accounts. So closing fake accounts, which is true regardless of whether those fake accounts come from a source within, you know, outside of government, within government, regardless. Um, we also have policies around, um, for example, misleading metadata um, on, on a lot of our platforms as well, which can often al allow videos to be struck basically misleading users. And once again, that doesn't matter the origin of the, of the content. So I, I take your point that it's delicate when governments make laws and governments can sometimes be the source of misinformation. But there's a lot of uh, po the way that we enforce our policies, the way that we approach these issues, that it, it really doesn't matter so much whether it's government or it's non-government. We're going to take the same action uh, regardless of, of, of the, or the source. So that's what I would say on that. Um, but definitely recognize that's a challenging issue. Thank you, Mr. Chek. And unfortunately, uh, our, our ex panelists, we have to limit our response because we also have time limitation. Therefore, I would like to uh, address the floor again because I still see many hands raised. Yes, thank you. And I have four questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I am from Russia. I am a representative of the civil society because I am a member of the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation. And I have a, I have a question for Jake and maybe for David. Uh, you know, Russian media, official media, um, have a lot of problems with such platforms as Facebook and Google. A lot of posts uh, of official Russian media and even their accounts were thrown away from Facebook, from Google, without any explanations. And you know, even all letters sent from Russian media to Google, they were unanswered. So Russian media didn't receive any explanations of their bans, and they didn't receive any letters at all. So my question is, uh, who is those judges? Uh, where is the court? Who decides what is fake news, what is hate speech? For example, se several days ago, I, I was in Washington, D.C., during the rally against Donald Trump near the White House, and I heard those speeches from people against Trump, it were always uh, hate speech, but Google and YouTube promoted such video without any problems. So uh, we see that uh, hate speech against Donald Trump, it is okay, and uh, news coming from Russia immediately become a hate speech or fake news. So who, uh, who decides? Yeah, very challenging issues that you're raising. So I would say a couple of things. One is we have many policies that we enforce globally that I mentioned earlier, but one function of being a company that has to operate in many jurisdictions is that we also have to comply with local law as it's written. So that means that if something is illegal in Russia, that for our local services that exist in Russia, we may be required by the government, you know, pursuant to a valid legal order to remove content for our Russian, Russian version of our products, for example. So I can't comment on the specifics of the cases you're raising, but that is, you know, sort of the reality of being a company. You have to operate according to the laws of the countries you operate in. Now, that wouldn't be removed globally. That would just be for Russian, Russian um, versions of the products, right, through the local versions. 
Um, that said, the same thing may not be legal, illegal in other places, right? So this enables us to be compliant country by country. But we do publish all of that information in our transparency report every year. So when something's been removed according to a valid legal order, um, the users have a way of, no, of understanding what's been removed, how many requests, for what types of legal violations, and all that's published on our website every year. So that's the way that people, could, the public can be made aware of, of what's being removed on the basis of a, of a legal request. To your question about the, um, the tr whether we would not remove something because it's related to Donald Trump, the answer is no. Our policies apply the same regardless. But that said, we do have certain guidelines that we use when we're thinking about enforcing our policies, that things that have educational, documentary, scientific, or artistic interest, sometimes we will view as less likely to be taken down because we think the public has an interest in knowing that. So that means that, for example, if there's a Donald Trump rally where there is a particular speech that's being conveyed in that rally that may be of interest to the public to understand what's happening in the political dimension, those videos may stay up because the public may want to know what you know what's happening in, in a particular political context. So now for a lot of those types of videos, we might age gate them where people have to be at least 18 years of old, older to be able to view them and have a warning message in front of them. But sometimes we will leave things up that are in the public interest because they have journalistic value you in that way. So that is something that we use to kind of contextualize our, our policies. And these are very difficult cases. You know, there's a lot of gray lines and we have lots of challenging internal discussions about the best way of drawing those lines. Uh, but it is something that we, we think very carefully about and try to strike a good balance of what the public needs to know with also making sure that people feel safe and secure on our, on our platforms. Thank you, Ms. Lukey, for yours. I, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of the case, so I'd have to, I'm happy to take your contact and because this is a blank. Yeah, I don't know about the specifics of that, that case, though. Sorry. Okay, thank you. And I see still some hands on the one, two, three, and four. So I think I'll start with uh, there first. Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry, before you start your question, please uh, briefly introduce and also briefly uh, state your question because we have time limitation. Thank you. Okay, my name is Emanuela, I'm from Brazil, and I'm an ISOC fellow. My question goes to, well, the Brazilian elections was a, li a little crazy. People use WhatsApp a lot, and although in our law we have the guarantee of net neutrality, we also have the practice of zero rating that is accepted in our country. So people receive these chains of texts on WhatsApp with fake news, but they can't check it because most people don't have uh, access to the internet because they only have their WhatsApp and it's like, oh, my cousin sent me this, so it must be true, but they can't fact check this. So I'd like some input. How do you guys think that we could change the situation considering zero rating, considering net neutrality issues? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Ms. Jackie perhaps would like to respond or Mr. Tekuki or Ms. Ms. Trento. Yeah, I'm just like busy writing down. That's a really great intervention. And I think that the issue around access to the internet and how we gain access to the internet, um, not just in terms of infrastructure or connectivity or devices, but also everything else surrounding it, right? Whether this is digital literacy or content skills and so forth, is a really important part of this conversation that I think of also often gets missed. Um, because we are often trying to see, oh, how can the platform provide a solution? Maybe it's just about fact-checking, maybe it's just about um, journalists and so forth. But access actually is at the basic premise. And we do know that a lot of this information is also distributed on WhatsApp. And in particular in countries which, um, like the BBC report in India, in Malaysia, in Brazil and so forth. And I don't think that opening up, like, you know, making end-to-end -end encryption in WhatsApp and opening that up is the solution. That really isn't it. it um, the, the issue is almost like this sits on top of a whole bunch of problems around democratic principles and processes, around the weakening of media as an institution, around the suspicion by states on digital literacy and critical information literacy by citizens. So, whole, yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you for raising that. That is an important piece of the puzzle that I hope also conversations around um, ensuring universal access and SDGs take this into consideration. Thank you, Ms. Jackie, and I think I would like to Go back to the floor, to the forum, and I saw still some hands. Can you please raise your hands again because I barely see it now. One, two, two. Okay, I'm sorry, but we have uh, only three minutes left, I guess. So I think I will take the young lady there and uh, you in there. Oh, sorry, and uh, you, sir, you can go to our panels after the session is finished. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Agita from Youth IGF Indonesia. 
So um, I have a very quick question, probably uh, refer to the government um, in here. So we have Ms. Julia and Ms. Latif. Um, would you aware that the EU recently proposed about the EU code of practice on disinformation to, con to combat fake news online, which are include uh, ensuring transparency, um, including the political advertising, enabling third party verification, closing the uh, fake accounts. Um, I would like to know, um, because this is still in the proposal, and um, I would like to know whether this is going to be a success code um, in terms of the um, EU, and then would like to know um, the Indonesian government perspective as well, whether um, we, in the future, we can, um, we can have this conduct as well, and the code as well for Indonesia. Thank you, and I think Ms. Julie will like to address. I'm not working directly on this. Um, what I would, maybe I just make some general rem remarks, okay? Um, what we're trying to do at EU level is to harmonize rules across the 28 different member states and to share best practice and certainly to close um, loopholes regarding a number of issues. So, you know, we're in the process of trying to close loopholes regarding tax evasion, for example. So um, trying to come together and make, um, make legislation. Always what we do is try and have balanced, balanced legislation. Um, the way that we do things is to have social dialogue, is to listen to all the different stakeholders, um, is to engage with them. So the process takes a long, I have to tell you the process takes a really long time. It takes a long time for 28 different countries to come together and agree things across several different political parties. Um, there's a kind of urgency though with this and the urgency is that the next iteration of the parliament may be much more right wing, more extremist, more anti-European even, more nationalist, yeah, than the current iteration of the parliament. Um, because everywhere we seem to be facing um, an attack on all our rights, I would say. Um, if I, um, I'm working on the Education and Culture Committee, and largely we're not a legislative committee. So uh, we can have an opinion that we can feed into uh, these matters, but we're not directly making the legislation. So what I would do is if, is, and, and you know we have a dialogue through Youth IGF already, so uh, I think you probably know more in terms of the detail, but I would really welcome anybody who has a concern to write to us because what we do is to have the dialogue, to listen, to raise concerns that are coming from citizens about any of the issues that um, um, will have, you know, will impact people. So. I mean, that's, that's probably the best way. I think Mia Petra uh, Kampala Natri, who is with me here um, this w uh, these two days, who's heading our delegation here, is working much more directly on this than I am. So I'm really willing to take the questions and, and forward them and get answers for you, okay? I'm not evading it, it's just it's not my competence, okay? Thank you, Miss Julie. And I'm sorry that we are out of time and we are more than welcome you to come later on, on with the panel because we have a con concluding remarks now. So um, the concluding remarks would be delivered by Ms. Uh, Marcela Zalianti. She is an artist and producer who is very, very passionate on digital literacy issue from his works and from his uh, activities. Please, Ms. Um, Marcela, the floor is yours. Bonjour, Madam Emisio. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, uh, this issue is being, uh, my, I really care about this issue and the fact that trade of fake news or we call hoax in Indonesia is massive targeting the younger generation, especially now that the internet access is getting easier. And it's not balanced with the ability and also the literacy of users to observe and manage the information. Young people is predicted to dominate the population pyramid in, in the 2030 According to the survey of the Providers Association, in 2017, the young generation with the range of 13 until 34 years old is the largest internet user with the percentage of 66.2%. Massive hoax circulating on social media 
media online and chat application will reach our young generation as the most active citizens and digital natives. They need to be equipped, they need to be equipped with critical thinking skills and fact-checking culture. They need to be involved to manage these issues as the internet uh, one of the major threats. Since Indonesia have a very big population with a different language, different religion, and different cultures, this fake news and hate speech not only threaten our democracy, also threaten our unity. Society needs to be directed to apply ethics in the real world when they were in the world wide web. Often they do not think far enough because they feel interaction in the virtual world is not really face to face, even though the consequences are the same now, where Indonesia uh, has an IT law that can uh, uh, prosecute speeches and behavior that uh, violates the law in the internet. Now also uh, the most important thing that we are focusing on digital literacy by creating this uh, movement called cyber creasy. I'm uh, one of the initiator and I think we all really agree that literacy is a very fundamental thing that we should do like right now uh, because um, uh, we not only do the repressive thing but we are thinking about the long term to, to settle to manage this, this issue. Cyber creasy is the national digital literacy movement are a multi-stakeholder, multi-discipline collaboration forum consisting of multi uh, in many um, uh, institutions, communities, civil organization, academicy, artists, content creator, media, and the private sectors, also the Minister of uh, Communication and Informatica. And uh, of course, we have one common vision, namely uh, to socialize the importance of digital literacy on a regular basis, we gathered agenda from 92 supporting partners engaged in the field of education related to digital literacy. Every week, there are at least five to 12 agenda carried out by supporting partners, both collaboratively and independently. Uh, here, digital literacy is not only the ability to operate a smartphone or computer device, but also the cognitive and emotional skills needed because the issues that must be reached by digital literacy program are very broad. Starting from child, female exploitation, protection, personal data, handling negative content, cyber abuse, and all that. And cyber crazy want to convince the public that a multi-stakeholder role is needed in, or, in order to realize the internet as a safe and comfortable place. Not only government, for example, the Ministry of Communication and Information or social media platforms, but also initiative from the community are needed to join to jointly uh, to against the negative effects of the internet. Uh, one example uh, of the multi stakeholder collaboration partners is the like Ministry of Communication and Information acts as a facilitator and accelerator of our program, uh, primarily because there is a common uh, and one uh, same vision and mission. Uh, such as def developing human resource capacity in digital field, empowerment communities advocating for the internet governance policies and to encourage the entry of digital literacy content in formal and non-formal education uh, curriculum. That's actually our target. Thank you, Ms. Alianti, for your concluding remarks. And on top of that, I would like to uh, put that definition of falsehood through determining what is true, what is not, is something that we still must have work on it. And of course, prohibition on content is not always the best part, but also literacy and educating the community who use internet is also another homework that we have to do in collaboration with platform provider, with the community, which that means we still have to work on multi-stakeholder approach and effort to ensure that this information and fake news distributed may be prevented and anticipated in the future. As the moderator of the session, I would like to thank you all of the participants for all of your participation and interest. I would like to apologize for not being able to accommodate all of your questions, but of course the panelists would love to see you around. And if you have some other question, you can raise it after the session is completed. The session is concluded and thank you very much for your attention.
pada nginep di bareng hotelnya sama yang sama siapa mbak? Dekatnya uh, Metro Station-nya apa? Oh, Saint Charles. Oh. Aku nama Metro Station-nya dekat. Oh.